welcome to the second episode of our podcast. My name's Salson. In the last episode, we heard from my colleague, Brad Parker, about the international legal framework for understanding the most common violations of Palestinian children's rights, including the systematic military detention of Palestinian children by Israeli authorities. In this episode, we're joined by our colleague, DCI Palestine Advocacy Officer, Shana Lowe. Like Brad, Shana is based in New York. In addition to engaging with the Canadian Parliament, Shana extensively compiles and analyses our documentation about Palestinian child prisoners, and so I asked her to talk us through the typical experience of a Palestinian child who's been detained militarily. Uh, Palestinian children are typically detained in the middle of the night from their homes. They can be arrested based solely on, on suspicion of committing a crime. And um, children are typically blindfolded and bound and and transported, um, not immediately to an interrogation center, but usually to a uh, Israeli settlement or military base um, before ultimately landing in an an Israeli uh, interrogation center. Their children are typically deprived of, of the right to have counsel present during their interrogation. They face all sorts of of ill treatment um, during during this period from the moment of their arrest until the the moment that they are finally released uh, to their families. But but typically the bulk of the violations, physical violations occur during their arrest and transfer. Uh, Children have no right to an attorney During their interrogation, they typically, um, the only right that they are afforded is to have a consultation, usually over the phone, with an attorney. And and as you can imagine, with um, when you're dealing with children, the the impact of those consultations is is really quite minimal. Children are then typically transferred to an Israeli prison. Almost all of the prisons that children and other Palestinian detainees are held at are located inside Israel proper. The transfer of a Palestinian child prisoner outside the occupied West Bank constitutes a war crime and also has the further practical implication of ensuring little or no contact between children and their families. Children can be um, arrested based on suspicion and convicted based solely on the word of a of an Israeli soldier. Children are rarely, if ever, granted bail or bond before their trial. And so they can end up spending weeks or even months in prison awaiting for the, the conclusion of their legal proceedings. Most of the children who DCI, or Defense for Children International Palestine represents, are forced to take uh, plea deals is that's the fastest way to to get them back to the safety of their families and their communities. Otherwise, they could spend weeks or or months even uh, as their as their case runs its courts. These military courts have conviction rates of ninety nine percent, so the probability a child would be convicted if they let a trial run its course is extremely high. By taking a plea deal, children are given lesser sentences than if their case went through an entire trial, where a sentence is typically much longer. It's important to note that these military courts are not do not meet international standards for independence and impartiality. The judges are commissioned or reserve officers in the Israeli military. So essentially, and, and they're reliant on their on their superiors for promotion. So essentially, they're on the same side as the as the prosecution. There's no um, independent judiciary in these military courts. Around 500 to 700 Palestinian children are arrested, detained and prosecuted in the Israeli military court system each year. At DCI, we represent about a quarter of these cases, and through our representation, we're able to recognise that ill treatment and the experiences of children within this system are rarely unique. Ill treatment incidents are not exceptions. The violations that Shana is about to describe are persistent, widespread, and systematic throughout the military detention system. It's really that moment that we see that that 
a part of that that child's innocence, a part of their childhood has been taken away from them because they, they're forced to recognize that their home isn't safe and their parents can't do anything to protect them. Um, in, in our documentation, about 95% of, of Palestinian children had their hands tied. Um, typically, these children have their hands tied with one or two um, zip ties, plastic ties around their, their wrists. They often complain that that um, that the the hand ties are so tight that it it leaves mark on marks on their hands. And frequently, our attorneys remark that even when they they see those children one or two days after their arrest, they can still see the marks on their hands. Um, similarly, about eighty six percent of the children are blindfolded after their arrest, so they're made to be disoriented. They're made to be vulnerable, and. As I mentioned earlier, these children are often transferred to one or two locations um, before, before they, they are finally interrogated. Um, during their, their, this transport period, this transfer period, um, many of them experience physical violence, about 73% um, talk about being, being physically abused. So that can be anything from kicking to hitting um, children have been struck with the, the stocks of, of soldiers' rifles. Just last year, we documented a case where a child from, uh, from the south of the West Bank had his jaw broken following his arrest um, when he was beaten by an Israeli soldier and, and struck in the face um, with the stock of a rifle. It took nearly 24 hours for that child to finally be taken to, to the hospital in Jerusalem where they diagnosed him with a broken jaw. Um, so we see all sorts of, of physical violence. A number of children, about 58%, um, report that they faced verbal abuse or humiliation or intimidation. Um, children are frequently um, insulted or have insults um, and vulgar language directed towards the, the female members of their family. Um, and and um, and so this is all occurring typically during that that initial arrest and transfer period, um, and and there's really um, it's 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 of course a traumatic experience for these children and something that's going to to stick with them beyond just the the physical pain or beyond just that moment. These are experiences that are going to impact these children for the rest of their lives. Palestinian children in the Israeli military detention system are rarely informed of their rights, and frequently we see that their right to consult a lawyer doesn't occur, or the lawyer doesn't accurately explain to a child their rights, or in a way that they can understand. About 97% of children in the data set described by Shana were interrogated without a family member. In these circumstances, children are vulnerable. Most are sleep deprived, and deprived often of food, water, and ability to use a bathroom and so they're placed in a vulnerable position where they're more likely to provide a confession regardless of their guilt and innocence. Oftentimes, children are told that if they don't confess or provide information, then a family member's permit to work in Israel will be taken away or another family member will be arrested. Israeli interrogators and Israeli forces use all sorts of means of coercing children to either provide information or confess to crimes that, that they may or, or may not have committed. More than 50% of children are, have, have reported that they were asked to sign and did sign documents that are in Hebrew. That's a language that most Palestinian children don't speak, nearly all Palestinian children don't speak or understand. And so they, they are, at, are signing, signing something that they, they don't understand. They might not even know what it says inside of that document. So these are just a, a, a few examples of the ways in which children experience ill treatment and rights violations uh, throughout their, their experience in the Israeli military detention system. I want to mention a couple of the examples that, that we see that, are, that go beyond kind of this normal um, so-called, or this typical, I should say, typical um, experience, and, and that's the practice of administrative detention and, and solitary confinement. Administrative detention is the detention of a child 
without charge or trial. Children are held based on so-called secret evidence, which is not shown to them or their attorney, so they have no means of, of challenging it. And an administrative detention order is issued by the, the military commander in the West Bank and, and then approved by a military court judge. It's it's nearly impossible, it is impossible for a child to defend themselves when they don't, when they aren't charged with anything and when they don't know the reason for their detention. Uh, this year, we've documented the case of a 17 year old boy, Amal Nahla, who was, who suffers from a um, autoimmune disorder, which impacts his ability to swallow and, and use his muscles. He requires, um, regular treatment and and um and and close observation of his condition he um he was initially arrested last year at the end of last year in november and charged with throwing stones uh due to the medical condition he was one of the few um, cases of a palestinian child who was granted bail prior to the conclusion of his of his legal proceedings the military court prosecutor appealed that decision, but the, the decision to grant Amal was upheld. And um, at that time, the military prosecutor had said that if they weren't able to keep Amal uh, in detention, they would arrest him and charge him under an administ and hold him under an administrative detention order. Amal was arrested in January of this year detained in January of this year. He has not been charged. He was granted a, a judge approved a six month administrative detention order, which was then re reduced to, to four months on appeal. That administrative detention order uh, expired on May 20th, but that day a judge approved a second four month administrative detention order. And these orders, which can be anywhere up to six months, can be renewed indefinitely. So it's it's basically giving Israeli authorities a carte blanche to detain Palestinian children and hold them without having to go through even the, the charade of um, presenting evidence. Amal's case is not that unique. We have documented three other 17-year-old boys who are currently uh, in, in Israeli prisons and being held under administrative detention orders. Obviously, the practice of administrative detention, it is something permitted under international law, but it is meant to used to be used sparingly and and really in extreme circumstances uh, where, you know, uh, exposing evidence would compromise um, sources. It can't just be used as a means of, of detaining people indefinitely without evidence. And that's that's really what we're seeing being done in cases like, like Amal's. In addition to our representation of these children in Israeli military courts and our documentation of their experiences, DCI Palestine runs a global advocacy campaign, No Way to Treat a Child, which aims to end the military detention of Palestinian children altogether. I invited back my colleague, Brad Parker, to tell us the origin of the campaign and the many successes it's achieved in the years since. The No Way to Choose Child campaign was, I, I guess, the foundation or the idea was, was you know, I think first lifted up um, in late 2013. Um, I had come back from uh, Ramallah, uh, with another colleague and our director at the time, Rafak Kassis, um, we had sort of planned a, a trip through the U.S. and speaking to her in sort of advocacy visit. And one of those uh, stops we had was in Chicago. Um, we participated in a, a few different events there, and there was a, a I forget the exact name of the, the conference, but um, a faith-based gathering uh, with a, a number of different activists and um, sort of church groups uh, that had been interested in raising the issue of, of Palestinian children detained and ill-treated in the Israeli military courts 
uh, through their local organizing and local campaigns. Um, it was, I think, at the University of Chicago, uh, where Jennifer Bing uh, with the American Friends Service Committee, uh, and then you know her her sort of partner in crime, uh, Joyce Castle, who I had corresponded with, you know, earlier in the year, and we had, you know shipped a, a DVD, uh, you know, from Palestine to to Chicago. Um, you know, those those initial connections were really what spawned the, the creative the creativity and thinking about how we could more intentionally bring these issues to you know in a more limited way um, just interested folks in Chicago and uh, congregations in Chicago uh, so that that really kind of the, the, the seed was was planted I guess in in late 2013 um, went back to Palestine uh, we kept on working, uh, you know, to think through some things, uh, and you know, it was probably in late 2014 where we said, "Let's let's do this. Let's have a joint project, a joint campaign, um, you know, with Defense for Children International Palestine, uh, bringing the the expertise of the the situation on the ground." Um, the human experience of Palestinian children that are prosecuted in the Israeli military court system. Uh, and let's team up with a US-based organization that has a long history working with Palestinians, um, working on the ground in Palestine, um, you know, essentially stretching back to you know, the, the 1947, 1948. Um, in the case of American Friends Service Committee. So um, it was a really nice partnership uh, and, and continues to be um, where we have the, you know, DCI Palestine as a local Palestinian organization connecting with a US-based group that has, uh, you know, constituency um, interest in these issues. And yeah, we, we launched the campaign in June, 2015. Um, we sort of went to Washington, D.C. and planned out uh, three days of advocacy, uh, including a, a congressional briefing where we had uh, Representative Keith Ellison sort of host the briefing. He provided remarks. Um, he's no longer in Congress, uh, but he, you know, he, he was one of the, you know, the first members of Congress to really be receptive and willing to, to lead and highlight these issues. Um, and, and that briefing really kind of set us off on a, a pretty good trajectory to, to have the No Way to, to Treat a Child campaign and, you know, Palestinian children in Israeli military detention um, forced sort of forward into the spotlight. So we left those three days hoping that we'd have a, a member of Congress willing to sign their name to a, a letter that was directed to the Secretary of State John Kerry at the time, uh, essentially, you know, just asking that this issue be recognized and uh, lifted up in conversations uh, that the, the State Department had with Israeli officials, um, recognizing that these are human rights violations and ill treatment that are existing as an institutionalized nature within the Israeli military detention system. Um, and after a couple of weeks, you know, we had, uh, well, I guess the first, I, I won't say a surprise, but <laughs> the welcome news of um, Representative Betty McCollum was interested to, to be the lead on the letter. Um, she, you know, this was an issue that was important to her, uh, didn't know about it, and, you know, was, was really keen to, to support and take action. Um, in solidarity with Palestinians and and sort of working with with DCI Palestine and, and American Friends Service Committee to highlight these issues, uh, and and then after a few weeks, you know, we had over I think it was 19 members of Congress had signed that first letter to the State Department, um, so that became our campaign launch. That became our um, sort of baseline for the work that continues to this day we set out to you know focus on congressional advocacy because it it was one thing that we felt 
I think at DCI Palestine, um, that we hadn't previously brought a narrow rights-based you know, child-focused issue uh, to policymakers in the United States. Uh, and obviously the United States with the, the unconditional funding and, and diplomatic support um, and protection sort of provided at the international level, uh, that's a massive obstacle to accountability. We, we, we felt that we had to at least kind of do that. Um, many people said that it was futile. Uh, many people sort of at the time said that, you know, there could, could be other things we could do that would be more useful. Um, but we felt that it was, it was important to do that sort of scoping out exercise to see what, you know, we could sort of build in, in, in you know, a short, shorter timeline. So that first letter that was led by Representative McCollum in 2015 was really, you know, a galvanizing moment. Um, that showed, you know, it wasn't futile, that there was sympathy here. And if you can bring a narrow rights-based issue to members of Congress, even if it's talking about Palestinian rights, um, there will be people willing to, to, to support it and um, champion it. So that was the sort of the origination of the campaign, um, one of the first successes. Uh, and then what we did or post June to 2015 was, you know, work to build a coalition of organizations, um, work to explain the, the congressional focus and the utility of it, um, and and you know just really work to build a movement demanding basic protections and accountability for for Palestinian children, um, and you know we followed that up. Um, those efforts up in 2016 with another letter led by Representative Betty McCollum calling for a, a, the creation of a special envoy for Palestinian children um, housed in the, the State Department. Um, that letter was focused and targeted to President Obama at the time. Um, and then, you know, following from there, we, we went into the, the 2016 election, presidential election, and um, you know, the result of, of having, you know, prospective Donald Trump presidency um, sort of forced us to, to rethink and sort of plan again. Um, and as we did that, you know, we continued to, to, to build coalition, work with groups throughout the U.S. Um, to press on these issues, and that ultimately led, in, led to the, the introduction of, of the first Palestinian human rights focused legislation ever in the United States Congress um, it was introduced in November 2017 and again was was introduced by uh, and sponsored by Representative Betty McCollum from, from St. Paul, Minnesota. So, um, you know, that trajectory, I think, just was persistence, <laughs> intentionality, uh, building through a range of different uh, sort of sectors of of Palestinian rights work um, and faith-based networks throughout the United States. Um, and, you know, now we're on our third bill uh, in the U.S. Congress. Each bill has sort of gotten increasingly uh, bolder um, over the past three congressional sessions. Um, you know, we currently have, I think, 27 co-sponsors on the, the latest bill. Um, and, you know, we'll continue to, to keep pushing, escalating, building the support in Congress, uh, while also kind of using the congressional advocacy approach and the rights-based focus um, to just bring these issues to Americans and, you know, increasingly other contexts uh, from Canada, UK, Ireland, uh, Belgium, you know, we want to keep using legislative vehicles, policy vehicles, engagement with, with lawmakers and policy and decision makers um, to, to give a trajectory to the education and awareness around these issues and just continue building a movement that demands accountability um, for such widespread and institutionalized human rights violations against Palestinian children. 
you'd like to know more about our congressional advocacy, we'll be diving deeper in a couple episodes time into the fascinating stories behind how we helped draft and introduce into Congress several groundbreaking bills. And in the next episode, we'll hear from Palestinian students and teachers about what education is like under occupation. So please make sure you're subscribed to the podcast on your favourite podcast app. For more information about our work, visit dci-palestine.org. Thanks for listening.